So my name is Cheva Lehrman. I'm one of the rabbinic interns here uh, at Beth Am, and uh, let's do some learning together. So um, I know that one person has the source sheet, but we have all, pretty much all the texts we need in the Tanakh. So the first text I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis 41, verse 37. And if I could have someone read from 37 to 43, and if for those who are comfortable using the microphone, we could pass that around. Thank you. It's on page 87. Bray sheet 41, 37. It's at the very bottom of page 87. Thank you, Marshall. Yeah. Okay, the plan pleased Pharaoh and all his courtiers. And Pharaoh said to his courtiers, could we find another like him, a man in whom is the spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is none so discerning as w and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my court and by your command shall all my peoples be directed. Only with respect to the throne shall I be superior to you. Pharaoh further said to Joseph, See, I put you in charge of all the land of Egypt. And removing his signet ring from his hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand. And he had him dressed in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. He had him ride in the chariot of his second in command. And they cried before him, Abrech, Thus he placed him all over the land of Egypt. Thank you. So how, so we have this moment in Parshat Miketz where Joseph goes from, uh, Joseph has his meteoric rise to a position of power. Um, and this moment at which he is officially uh, enshrined, so to speak, in his new position of authority is in verse 42. Um, if you want to look at the Hebrew, it says, Vayasar paro et tabato me al yado, viyiten ota al yad Yosef. And then it goes on to talk about how he uh, dressed Joseph in the garb of, of royalty, of Pharaoh's household. Um, this, this line, Vayasar paro et tabato, just to flag that for a moment because we're going to come back to that, but in a different context. Yasar is a verb that means to turn aside or chasten or to take off. So, uh, he is taking off his taba'a, his signet ring, and that is the moment at which Joseph comes to power. So my first question for you is, how would you, what words would you use to describe Joseph's new position and its implications? How, what uh, adjectives would you use for the, the state or position that Joseph is in now? Chief of staff almost, Chief of staff almost yeah. Hmm? Vice president in charge of things, and and uh, okay, and other than t yeah, sorry, prime, mm -hmm. prime minister, and and what adjectives do you ascribe to this sort of position? Adjectives would you use for this sort of position? Powerful, powerful. Abuse of power. Mm -hmm. How, what's the contrast with Joseph's uh, position from the Parsha that we just concluded this morning, from Parsha Vayeshev? Powerless, in the pits, in prison. Um, there's a certain security that Joseph has gained by getting this p new position, right? He, uh, as as Pharaoh says. Uh, you are in charge of all of Egypt. No, there will be no difference between you and me, except that I have this throne. He arrived. He arrived. Yes. Um, who? Mm, okay. Uh, she said she wouldn't say security because he could be unceremoniously dethroned as well. So this is all good to keep in mind. And who? And he almost was. Who is most affected by Joseph's new position? Who's most affected in this moment? The wise men in the court around Pharaoh do not realize that now he's going to be in power, but it's very unsecure. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat, and then we can start passing the mic to those who feel comfortable. Uh, but Alan said, the, the wise men in the court of Pharaoh, who will be affected by Joseph's presence. Who else is affected by Joseph's position now? Joseph, yes. Joseph is very affected by his new position. <laughs> yeah. Who's going to be affected? Not yet, but who will be affected by his position? Joseph's brothers and the Jews. Right. So, so there's going to be a, you know, a strong impact down the road, but we're not there yet. But right now, this is an important change. So there, one of the central things that I see in this moment is this transition right, from, from the powerlessness to the powerful, but also all of the implications that go with that, some of which are good and some of which are a little bit dangerous. Um, there's another very comparable situation. Uh, we're actually not going to get quite to the same language yet. We're going to stop somewhere first, which is in the book of Esther. Um, so if you can flip to page 1,792 in the Tanakh, that is Esther 5, verse 2. Now it was 1792, Esther 5, verse 2. And if someone could read verses 2 to 5, please. Wait, wait. Thus said the Lord of hosts. Oh, no. Uh, oh, Esther. Okay, thank you. Um, as soon as the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won his favor. The king extended to Esther the golden scepter which he had in his hand, and Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. What troubles you, Queen Esther, the king asked her, and what is your request? Even to half the kingdom, it shall be granted you. If it please your majesty, Esther replied, let your majesty and Haman come today to the feast that I have prepared for him. The king commanded, tell Haman to hurry and do Esther's bidding. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. Thank you. So what is the gesture that brings Esther to power? Unintentional rhyming. But um, what is, yeah, I see demonstration. Golden scepter, the sharvit, as it's as, as it is in Hebrew. So, um, and he extends it towards her, and he uh, and he touches the tip of the scepter as she kneels before him. Right. So we have a different gesture of power transfer here. Um, Who is affected by Esther's authority at this point? Haman, Esther, the king. The king? Yeah. Who's going to be affected by Esther's authority? Haman. Yeah. And the Jewish people. Anyone else? Mordechai. Mordechai. Anyone else? All, yeah, all the people who end up dying at the end of the story. So the entire kingdom of Shushan is going to be infected by Esther's power. We don't always like to read that part, but we're going to read it today. <laughs> um, so, so Esther... <laughs> So Esther is, Esther's rise to power is, uh, is going to be also very impactful. But of course, she's not the only one who's rising to power in the story. Flip forward just another page, actually two pages, to chapter 7, verse 11, on page 1796. Wait, sorry, that doesn't make sense. There is no verse 11. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1. I, I wrote it down wrong. Here we go. Okay, so chapter 8, verse 1. Um, yes, Alan? Uh, uh, just um, two, two verses. Oh, okay. Yeah. That very day, King Ahasuerus gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, 
to Queen Esther. Mordechai pre him presented himself to the king, for Esther had revealed how he was related to her. The king slipped off his ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and gave it to Mordechai, and Esther put Mordechai in charge of Haman's property. Okay, thank you. And um, can you read the first three words in Hebrew of the second verse? Mm -hmm. I have to see where the second verse begins here. Hang on. Oh, by Yasar HaMelech et Tabaato. Yes. Same, so, same pasuk, same phrase. Of same phrase, by Yasar HaMelech et Tabaato. So again, we have the, the sovereign giving his signet ring. Who's he giving it to? Mordechai. Mordechai. He's giving it to Mordechai, right? But then what's at the end of the second verse? What is the hierarchy of, of power that we see at the end of the second verse? Esther put Mordechai in charge okay. of Haman's property. So, so it's still King Esther Mordechai. Yes, exactly. Um, and so we have this moment at which Esther is in power. Mordechai is rising to power, but somewhat as Esther's directee. Um, and, and yet it's unclear like who the people look to for power in this moment. And it continues to be unclear because Esther gives direction, but I want you to keep going further to verse to chapter nine, next page, verses three and four. And I want you to skim just to the end of verse three, where it says, um, all the officials of the provinces showed deference to the Jews because the fear of Mordechai had fallen upon them. For Mordechai was now powerful in the royal palace, and his fame was th spreading through all the provinces. The man Mordechai was growing ever more powerful, or in Hebrew, gadol. So in this case, what sort of power does Mordechai seem to have? Popularity. Yes, we can read the next line. <laughs> yeah, so, and the next line is, so the Jews struck at their enemies with the sword, slaying and destroying. They wreaked their will upon their enemies. So what's happened between uh, seven and nine is that Esther has, chapter seven and nine, is that Esther has given, has petitioned the king for the Jews to have the right to defend themselves. And the Jews do defend themselves in a very almost aggressive way, killing a lot of people. Um, so... So this fear of Mordechai, what is that? Mm -hmm. Power, yeah, power of the sword. They, they're afraid he's going to kill them. Yeah, Marshall? I don't know if it's particularly relevant, but there's another use of the word pachad in Genesis, the word pachad yitzchak. And I don't know exactly what pachad yitzchak means. Is it maybe, does it mean fear or is it like, the power of Yitzchak or the power of Mordechai. I, I don't know exactly what it means. I don't remember the context yeah. in, um, in Genesis. That's a great question, the Pachad Yitzchak and what the context and meaning was. I actually don't know the answer either. I'm wondering if anyone else has an answer to Marshall's question. Yeah, so, so okay. Between Pacha and Yura. Yura usually does have a, um, a greater range towards the positive connotation. And Pacha is, is exactly what we think of in the English definition of fear, the negative, yeah. yeah. Um, any other thoughts on the com comparison to Pacha Yitzchak? So these are all. So what is something that Purim has in common? with the holiday that's much closer on the calendar, starting on Sunday, Hanukkah. Ella, do you have an answer? No? <laughs> She's very excited about Hanukkah. Hanukkah is good, yes, we are excited. Military victories. Military victories. Unexpected things happening. Can you take the microphone? 
She has a microphone for you. I didn't know I was that eloquent. Uh, okay. <laughs> you are. Uh, we want to hear what you say. talking about people um, who don't have um, any power unexpectedly without even knowing it suddenly um, being granted power that they didn't have before. You're, ta um, you're talking about unexpected um, circumstances, so to speak, and, mm. and Hanukkah is about unexpected, mm. it's unexpected miracles, so, you know, yeah. uh, things nobody anticipated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yes. Um, hand on Zoom. Please um, my sound's been going on out, but are we comparing Purim and Hanukkah? Yes. Because there are a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Um, prolonged how you do things is prolonged because even if Purim's only one day, the you have to prepare. You have to prepare the packages you're going to take to people. It takes more preparation. Late in Jewish history, if, I mean, events later in Jewish history, and then neither of them are a chag. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Mm. Her point with Purim and Yom Kippur being um, paired holidays, yeah. That's a play of words because it's Yom Kippurim, Yom Kippurim, a holiday like Purim. Mm -hmm. and that's a rabbinic yeah. notre coon to be able to divide the word to be able to do it in that way. Okay, but the, the other point, on both days, we say al hanisim. Yes. We say about all, about all, about miracles. So in both instances, it's viewed as miraculous Right. about what had taken place. You can see the swift rise to power of both Joseph and Mordechai could be part and parcel of that miraculous development for mm -hmm. the Chag, yeah. the Chagim. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, so um, the but, Shalosh Regalim have a, a connection to the agricultural component that neither Hanukkah nor Purim have. Yes, but it's interesting that on Hanukkah we do we say Hallel, but on Purim we do not. Mm. So when it says it's a question of why, you know, the rabbis like to say, well, because that was a miracle that happened in Israel, and this happened outside of Israel. Purim happened outside of Israel, so it can't be celebrated. I think there may be more to the story than that. What would you say for yourselves of why one would say Hallel on Hanukkah, but not on Purim? Dan? Can you say that into the mic? Thanks. I think because of the rededication of the temple, mm -hmm. and I think that, and it's, and it's eight nights, but I think in particular because the, the synagogue is important mm -hmm. and is central. Um, and the other thing which to me is really interesting is Shabbat Hanukkah and I think it's going to happen this year when it's Rosh Chodesh there's three yeah. Torahs yeah. and I know a couple who currently live in Israel but used to live here who that was their wedding and their oof roof wow. so that has stuck with me for years I think that perhaps this is what Alan was referring to. I think that the reason not to say hollow on Purim is the ongoing discomfort of the rabbis with the absence of God in Megillat Esther. Mm. And I, the absence of God in that, in that holiday and having to write God in, um, it's just very uncomfortable because the use of Psalm 118 broken up and some other Psalms in Hallel to thank God for the miracles. I mean, even the stretch to put together an al hanisim for Purim that includes God is strikes me as really odd liturgically because like, wh where is God in the story? We have to put God in. So I, that, that for me is the most obvious reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting also in thinking about these three stories compared to each other is that there isn't a lot of God in the Joseph story either. Right, like there isn't a sense that like God is shepherding Joseph up the chain of command. It's just a story. Yeah, do you? Great. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So the counterpoint is that what got Joseph to the place of being recognized is prophetic dreams. And what I'll add to your counterpoint to the point I was making is that when Joseph sees his brothers at the end of the whole story, he says, God brought me to this place. You did not send me. Yeah. Yes, and Joseph gave God credit for the ability to interpret. So there, there are ways in which Joseph credits God, and we trust that Joseph's right, um, but we, we don't hear God speaking to Joseph like we see later God speaking to Moses, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's more implicit. It's like under the surface. Um, and we, it's not that we have any discomfort with a, a relationship between God and Jews reaching positions of authority or security, Right, we have it in Alenu. We have it in Amida. We have like we have prayers about that, and I'm curious what you what your feeling is about those prayers, about praying those prayers. Yeah. So in, um, so in in the Amida we have Le Malshinim, right, and we we say let there be no hope for. Um, it's translated in, um, it's, it can be translated as the informers, but it's the Zedim, right? So, like, the, the betrayers. Um, and may you, like, crush, rout, subdue, uproot the insolent people, right? It's a very um, strong prayer. In some prayer books, it's actually one of the most commonly changed parts of the Amidah, right? There's um, the Reform prayer book draws on the Buria story from Brachot 10a, where... Um, where she says to Rabbi Meir, don't condemn, sinner, don't condemn sinners to die, condemn the sin. And, uh, and so they, they changed the, that language of the prayer to be more about let sin be crushed from the earth rather than sinners. There, there's another change in the Talmud. It's referred to as the meaning prayer. Yeah. And later it was, it was changed, and there's a... Um, uh, the meaning were going to be the different sects. There was, there was some who believed that this was actually the 19th prayer that was added in to the Amidah to represent the, at the time of Jews uh, who were turning to Christianity. And that's why they were viewed as the heretics taking place here. Mm -hmm. But yet there was another response to that, that, they, that, that it was already there as part of it. And the two that were added in were the one about Jerusalem Bonei Yerushalayim and Etzemach David, mm -hmm. and those two were found together in the Kaiser and the uh, Cairo Geniza as being one, um, dating to the year about 1000. But there was difference what was going on in Jerusalem, what was going on in Babylonia. But the notion was that it's a, it's a convoluted history, and there are lots of different theories about what's going on with respect to what this what this means. But there is no question that it involves a real sense of uh, uh, people on the outside, you have to be beware of people that are going to be on the outside or maybe betraying you. Right. That's way be, and that's, that can be a real issue when you talk about safety and security and what have you. Right, right. So just being sensitive to the time. Um, oh, Shava, Shava yes. though, I've had my hand up oh, for a while, which is sorry. why I got the exclamation point, because I thought someone said not agricultural, and I want to counter that strongly. Okay. Hanukkah is agricultural. Because one, it's a deferred Sukkot. So, so if it's a deferred Sukkot, it's the harvest of all seven species. And more importantly, at Sukkot is when the olive harvest is just starting. The olive harvest ends at Hanukkah and without olives for the oil, there couldn't have been a rededication. So it's absolutely agricultural. Thank you. And I actually am going to, um, I'm going to take the blame for misquoting Sandra, in that it was, she was saying the Shalosh Raglim are agricultural pilgrimage festivals um, and not just that they're agricultural. So I think you're both right. <laughs> um, uh, so, I didn't hear her. I only heard you. Right, because I was repeating back. Got uh, it. Got it. And then maybe around. I misheard old yeah. person on No, Zoom, no, but... I, I misquoted. You're good. Um, so, uh, so, when, so I think that when we see these prayers and when we see this text, there's a, there's a loop here of the fact that fear and insecurity is real, and the security that comes with power is also real and valid. 
And it's okay to have those reflected in our stories or to need an outlet for those feelings in our prayers, right? Or to reach to God for that moment. But one of the other parts of this is that there are challenges in having these stories, you know, and there's challenges in having these examples in our text. And so when I was wrestling with this, I came upon this text by Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler in Michtav Me Eliyahu, and this is what he said uh, that, that to me resonated with these stories and prayers. I'm required to support the entire world. As the verse says in Proverbs 10, 25, the righteous are the foundation of the world. I'm responsible for everything that happens in the world because I was created to fix the world. Even if others neglect their duty, as each person is required to fix the world, I must act as if there's nobody else beside me to do it. So in holding all of that, he looks to God's example of holding the full world and says, I will lean into this. I will lean into holding the world and holding my responsibility to it, um, regardless of what others are doing around me. And, um, and then that is the path that I choose to follow. And that reminded me, of the line from Psalms, Lo yanum velo yishan shomer Yisrael, right? That like we trust in God, that God will not rest, God will not uh, let up in in protecting us, as well as we have responsibility to protect us and protect all those around us. <laughs>